Okay, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for making time to join us tonight. I'm really delighted um, to be the first to introduce you um, to our event. My name is Nancy Kwok. I'm a history professor and director of the Institute of Arts and Humanities here at UC San Diego. Um, and to tell you just very briefly about the Institute, for those of you who um, are encountering IH for the first time tonight, um, we are sponsoring this event. We are an interdisciplinary organization supporting vibrant, engaged, and rigorous research and teaching. We have a special emphasis on equity, diversity, and inclusion, um, both in our 14 interdisciplinary programs and also in the event series that we organize, including the event series titled Challenging Conversations. Um, this virtual teach-in tonight is part of this series. Uh, for those of you who'd like to learn more, we encourage and welcome you to participate in more of our events. Um, and you can join our listserv or contact us uh, directly at IAH at UCSD.edu. Um, for tonight's event, I want to start by thanking Anna Marie Buenviaje, our events specialist, as well as Professor Simeon Mann, who will be introducing the rest of our panelists in a moment. Um, just to tell you a little bit about Dr. Mann. Uh, Professor Simeon Mann is a historian of race and empire in the 20th century, and he has researched and published extensively on topics related to American militarism and trans-Pacific activism. So I'll turn over the mic to him now so that he can introduce the rest of our panelists. Thank you again for coming. Good evening, everyone, and thanks, for, uh, thanks so much for joining us for this virtual teach-in about the current crises at the Otay Mesa Detention Center. I want to begin by acknowledging that we are on the unceded territories of the Kumeyaay people, the traditional stewards and caretakers of this land we call San Diego and the Tijuana-San Diego border region. This acknowledgement is partly a reminder that as we focus our attention on the urgency of what's happening inside the jail at Otay Mesa, the public health crisis there and in jails and in prisons throughout the United States is what indigenous activists in the Navajo Nation and in the Amazon have been referring to as the continuing genocide. That is, now more than ever, we're reminded that the urgent work of decarceration must remain attentive to the work of decolonization. The crises indeed are multiple and entangled. At Otay Mesa Detention Center, before the pandemic, migrant detainees were already testifying to the horrific conditions including lack of access to basic hygiene necessities, medical neglect, insufficient and contaminated food, forced labor and wage thefts, all of which have been documented in a report by Allies to End Detention. And you can find the full report on their website and learn more about the important work that this organization has been doing. The pandemic has exacerbated these conditions of vulnerability. As of this week, the Otay Mesa Detention Center continues to have the largest outbreak of COVID-19 of any ICE facility nationwide, with at least 155 who have been infected and one who tragically died under ICE captivity. Carlos Escobar Mejia, a 57-year-old from El Salvador who fled with his family from the US-backed civil war in the 1980s. So to tell us more about what has been going on inside the jail and what detainees and activists are doing in response, we are joined today by three speakers. Our first speaker is Vanessa Sesenia, who is the Human Rights Program Associate for the American Friends Service Committee, US-Mexico Border Program. The AFSC has been documenting human rights abuses and continues to advocate for the rights of migrants in the border region, including supporting the Freedom All campaign. Our next speaker is Monica Langarica, who is an immigrants' rights staff attorney at ACLU of San Diego and Imperial Counties. The ACLU has litigated multiple cases since the onset of the pandemic, seeking the release of people from immigration jails and prisons. To date, its litigation has secured the release of about 100 people from ICE jails in the region. Our third speaker, Cynthia Marlene Galas, is the National Hotline Director and Policy Monitor for Freedom for Immigrants. Last month, Freedom for Immigrants launched a COVID-19 detention hotline for advocates and loved ones to report instances of abuse in ICE jails and prisons. Through the hotline and letters from people in detention, 
They are documenting, categorizing, and verifying to the extent possible human and civil rights abuses inside prisons and jails throughout the country. Finally, I want to introduce my co-organizer and co-moderator for tonight's event, Jess Woodcott, who is an assistant professor of women's studies at San Diego State University and a volunteer with Allies to End Detention. They will be moderating the Q&A during, uh, during that portion of the events. So a little bit about the format and then we'll get started. So we have asked the speakers to prepare their remarks around three questions. The first is, what is happening inside the jail? Second question, what is your organiza uh, organization doing in response to the crisis? And what are next steps and strategies moving forward? And the third, what can people do to help? The speakers will each have about five minutes to respond to each prompt. And in, be uh, in between each round, we will have time for one or two clarifying questions from the attendees. But we're gonna save the majority of questions for the Q&A portion at the end. And if you have a question, please go ahead and use the Q&A function, and you can feel free to input that question anytime. And those of you who are engaging with the ASL interpreters, please feel free to pin their window on your screen if you need to. Okay, so um, with that, let's go ahead and get started. Um, and we'll begin with Vanessa Sesenya, if that's okay. Um, so the first question, what has been happening inside Otay Mesa Detention Center? Yeah, thank well, first I want to start off by saying thank you for, you know, inviting me to speak to everybody today. Um, as somebody that has been doing immigration related work um, for around 11 years, um, I find these opportunities to engage with folks that are not necessarily doing um, this type of work day to day um, as some of the most, you know, important um, encounters or forms of engagement, you know, um, with, with community members. So yes, uh, thank you again. Um, so as um, Simeon was saying, I work with American Friends Service Committee, and here in San Diego, we have the U.S.-Mexico border program. Um, and a lot of our work um, during the last few months around the Free Them All campaign has really focused on supporting the grassroots organizing efforts of the Otay Mesa detention resistance and of Pueblos Sin Fronteras um, as they um, work to support people that are detained at the Otay Mesa Detention Center as well as um, some people from the Adelanto Detention Center which is in the um, LA County area. Um, <clears throat> so I thought it would probably make more sense for me to um, start off by talking about some of the, just what we've been hearing nonstop from so many different people that are detained. Um, just to kind of like paint, uh, paint a picture of the, just the horrible um, treatment that people are getting. Um, a lot of what we're hearing is unfortunately not new. Um, these are the detention centers that ICE has and the ones that, that Border Patrol have um, are, are, are just horrible and they're definitely, it's not a place for, for people to, to be detained or whatnot. Um, but during the COVID pandemic, um, we definitely heard over and over again that people were not getting um, the proper cleaning supplies um, that they needed, um, right? And that are part of like the CDC <laughs> guidelines in terms of like, how can you prepare um, and how can you maintain safe during this pandemic? So we were hearing that um, core civic staff and core civic again is the private um the private company that runs that detention center um so they weren't giving folks um the proper cleaning supplies which was like um you know like uh antibacterial uh, gel or, or sprays um or even enough towels right so we were hearing from people that they were given um like one spray bottle of something to spray um, down their pod or their unit, but they were also being only given one towel. And that towel was um, supposed to be used to clean the bathrooms, to clean the tables, to clean basically everything in, in their area. And 
obviously, right, that's pretty pro problematic. Um, they were also not being given in the beginning um, face masks or gloves or any of this, um, like the pretty basic um, PPE that we're seeing um, as one of the main ways that we can protect ourselves during this pandemic. Um, at one point they were being given, um, or they started to be, be given um, these masks, but um, the detention center staff was asking them to sign some type of waiver um, that was only, um, I believe in English. Um, so point is not a lot of people understood what it is that they were asking them to sign. In a nutshell, um, the detention center was asking them to sign this waiver that said if they got sick, the detention center would not be held liable. Um, so I did hear one recording of um, it from a female pod um, during one interaction um, where um, core, core civic staff were asking folks to sign this waiver and it ended up turning into this really intense moment um, that we were able to, to capture um, where um, they started being um, pepper sprayed, the people in the units. So um, we were, what we have been regularly seeing, sorry, is that um, when the detainees or the people that are detained are asking for ICE or for core civic staff to essentially respect them as people uh, during this pandemic, that they're being, um, part of the response is like some form of retaliation. We've heard of people being put into segregation or into these single cells when they have um, you know, advocated for their rights while um, being in detention. Um, for a while, there were some people that participated in a hunger strike. Some of them also um, got put into segregation um, and they were being threatened also to, um, sorry, they were being threatened that um, they were not going to be able to access their commissary or make phone calls um, or whatnot. Um, but yeah, so even though this has this has been going on for a few months, we um, every day we're hearing from our partners, OMDR and PSF, that people are, are sharing the same types of of issues, right? The same types of grievances. Um, so I'll leave it at that because I know the two other presenters um, are going to share a lot of other details. Thank you, Vanessa. So next, um, can we have Monica respond to the same question? So what has been going on inside the jail? Absolutely. Um, and thank you for, for all of you for joining us on this Thursday afternoon. Um, I am really happy to be here and to share with you all. Um, first, I'll just uh, I've been introduced, but I, I want to start off by sharing that um, I'm, you know, Monica Langarica. I'm a staff attorney at the ACLU of San Diego and Imperial Counties. Uh, I do work around immigrants' rights. Um, and before I was with the ACLU, I did uh, direct representation, almost exclusively um, removal defense for folks who uh, have been adjudicated mentally incompetent to represent themselves. Um, and before that, I worked at uh, public defender's office and a couple of other places. Um, but more importantly, I, I want to share that I'm, I'm native to the borderlands. Um, I was born and raised in San Diego uh, with family on both sides of the border. And I'm the product of movement across the border. Uh, my work is certainly a professional endeavor, but it's also deeply personal. Um, and I'm, I'm just, I'm thrilled and I'm thankful to be speaking alongside two women of color. Um, who, who do this work um, also, I, I know, from a, from a sense of deep personal commitment. Um, so I, I'll answer the prompt now um, and, and share that I, I think it's, I'm going to preface the story that I want to share by saying that when we do this work, I think it's, it's easy and sometimes enticing to give into um, and sometimes perpetuate these false binaries of who is good and who is bad or who is worthy um, and who is undeserving. Um, because in many ways, our, the, the movement uh, in, in defense of and in furtherance of immigrants' rights 
um, in, in many moments has benefited from that binary. Um, but I've worked with people both during this pandemic and long before it who have made me certain uh, that nobody is the product of their worst act and that nobody is above rehabilitation um, and worthiness. Nobody is above or below rather uh, the, the ability to love and be loved um, or below the, the right to freedom of movement. Um, and I'll share the story of one person who I'll call um, Ana Maria. This is a woman who's a, she's a mother of two now college educated women. She's a grandmother. She's a long time lawful permanent resident and survivor of domestic abuse. Um, she lived for a long time here in San Diego um, and as, as a lawful permanent resident. And ultimately after a really series of unfortunate events, uh, suffered a, a criminal conviction for which she served less than a year in uh, a carceral institution in a jail. That incident happened in mid-2015. And Ana Maria first saw daylight as a free person after that incident earlier this month. That's almost five years later. She's somebody who was in, a, she served again a, a, a criminal sentence of less than a year and then was in immigration detention from 2016 until May 2020. I represented this woman in her removal proceedings a couple of years ago. Um, she's an older uh, grandmother. She suffers from multiple um, underlying medical conditions, including asthma and mental health issues. Um, and when I represented her, I tried everything that was in my arsenal to get her out of detention because I was certain that she deserved, in spite of everything that the system wanted to accuse her of, that she deserved to be out and free while she fought to remain in this country. Um, and there were bond hearings, there were um, uh, requests to reconsider bad determinations, there were applications for relief, um, there was an attempt to get into federal court, there was advocacy in the press, um, and, and, and ultimately, you know, the system did not relent with her, um, and she stayed inside for years. Um, and she stayed inside a result, as a result of this, of this one conviction that caused uh, the immigration court to try to take her lawful permanent residency away. Um, and that ultimately tried to keep her detained until she was deported. It, ultimately, the, this woman um, ended up getting out as a, as a part of, or as a result of litigation that I'll talk about in a, mo a little more in a moment, um, th that our office brought in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, seeking the, the release of medically vulnerable people from the Ote Mesa Detention Center. Ana Maria's story is, is to me uh, uh, an example of why it, is, it has been time, but right now is, is a, as good a time as any to reimagine an immigration system that somebody, uh, I guess I'll, I'll back up and say, I heard people talking recently about, you know, kind of this desire to return back to normal. Um, and I, I heard a really important critique of, of that desire, right? If there's anything that this moment has taught us, it's that what was normal led to, what, to, to the situation we find ourselves now. What was normal is abusive and it's violent, and it's especially violent for communities of color, for black communities, for folks who are vulnerable. And so, and the same is true uh, for, for everything that we know about immigration enforcement what was normal led to what became a deadly situation in immigration detention. Uh, and, and that's not hyperbole. Um, and so Ana Maria's story for me, again, is just one example of why this is the moment to reimagine an immigration system that will never, there may be a, a new novel virus in the future. There may be another moment that really brings this country and this world to its knees, but we cannot find ourselves in a moment again that will needlessly imperil the lives of people like Ana Maria with the justification that 
they fall on the unfavorable side of this false binary, right? The government has justified time and again keeping people like Ana Maria locked up in immigration prisons because they, because of it, of a, because they contend that she's not worthy of, of release or of freedom. And that's, that's wrong, but we also know that it's deadly. Um, so I am going to wrap up there and then, and then we'll talk a little later. Thank you, Monica, for sharing that. Um, so next we have Cynthia. Same question to you. What has been happening inside the jail? Thank you so much. Um, thank you for everyone, uh, to everyone for being here. Um, I am very excited to be here today. Um, even if it's virtually, this is a very powerful experience to me. So if you see me a little bit jittery, that is why. Um, I came to the US as a teenager in the summer of 2009, and I started my sophomore year. Um, and my first home was in San Isidro, and I went to San Isidro High School. Um, which is an immigrant community um, in southern San Diego, uh, which is only a minute, uh, just minutes away from the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, and then later on, I learned that my high school um, was only 13 minutes away from the Otay Mesa um, detention facility. So when I first arrived to the U.S., I and I was learning English, and I was, you know, um, going through this journey of like becoming an immigrant. Um, I never would have imagined that um, a few years later, um, I will be speaking on the phone with people detained at the time cell detention facility, um, where there's a recorded history of human rights abuses and neglect uh, for members of my own community. Um, so, and I really wanted to share that too. Um, contextualize that we are all impacted by the abuses happening inside of this uh, facility and every detention facility. Um, even if you're not an immigrant, um, we are all directly responsible to take action against the abuses that are facilitated, frankly, by our tax dollars and that are happening under our watch. Um, I, I know that this was mentioned before, but I really want to take a minute and emphasize that ICE jails and prisons have always been this bad. Um, as Monica was saying, this we do not want to go back to the normal um, that we had before. Um, this fiscal year alone, about 14 people have died in ICE jails, and then for years we have recorded medical neglect, physical abuse, and unsanitary conditions, as well as organizing by um, people in detention. So that is just to say that COVID-19 is only shedding light on a system that is already rotten and was um, designed this way. Um, so as it was mentioned already as well, Ota, the Otemesha Detention Facility is the ICE jail with the most reported positive cases. And at least one person, um, Carlos Ernesto Escobar Mejia, has died inside of the facility. Um, and we knew that a death was going to happen and people in detention did too. Um, in early April, for example, a detained person called us through the hotline and they told us that, um, and I'm, I'm quoting here, we know that someone will die because Core Civic is not equipped to handle this crisis. Uh, the guards are not using protection. Um, and, you know, it happened. People in detention lost a friend and also they're still under the threat of um, getting sick. Um, and medical neglect for people who have um, who are sick with COVID-19 as well as for people with other medical conditions is um, is prevalent in detention um, and in the Otemesa detention facility specifically. Um, we've talked with people who have uh, pneumonia only getting Tylenol instead of proper treatment. We've talked to people who have COVID-19 like symptoms who are given salt packages to make gargles with. Um, people who have been sick with the virus uh, tell us that in 14 days that they were sick, um, they never um, saw a doctor 
and they were only given hot water to drink. Um, they also tell us that um, while they are that while they were in isolation and sick, they weren't able to communicate with their families. Um, and if they were able to, maybe it was like once or twice in those 14 days. Um, and then after those 14 days of isolation, um, it has been reported to us that um, people are just released into general population again, even though they might still be uh, contagious. So it's really clear that um, Core Civic and ICE is not taking the health and the lives of people in detention seriously. And that brings me to conditions at the Yotay Mesa detention facility um, and how it is really impossible to remain healthy um, in a detention facility. Um, so for example, one person in detention told us um, that they are informed about ways um, in which the virus is transmitted and how to prevent infection, but really the conditions of the facility do not allow them to follow these practices because they cannot socially distance, distance um, within the facility. There are just too many people there. Um, so um, just to be really clear, the best way to prevent for more people getting sick and exposed to the virus is by letting them socially distance at home. Um, all of them are safer at home, and that includes um, people who are in immigration detention. Um, we've also received reports of lack of hygiene supply, supplies, including soap shortages. Um, people in detention have told us that they are only given really small bars, like hotel sized, and those are meant for them to both wash their hands and also for showering. Um, so that's not really enough to prevent um, to, to maintain hygiene necessary to prevent um, infection for the virus. Um, and I, I also really want to highlight and really emphasize that people in detention are not passive in this fight. Um, they are actively resisting and protesting against these deadly conditions. Um, there have been open letters, recordings, um, as well as hunger strikes within the facility. And unsurprisingly, as um, as Vanessa was saying, we have seen uh, these efforts by people in detention being met with retaliation. Um, so for example, in April 4th, it was the first time that a hunger strike was reported to us and detained men were protesting lack of information even after there had been confirmed, case at the, confirmed cases at the facility um, and they were also demanding release. Um, we also saw hunger strikers being retaliated against by being placed in solitary confinement, as well as threatened with um, use of pepper spray against them. Um, one man who was placed in solitary confinement told us that um, his, his body was very weak uh, for being on hunger strike. And even on top of that, the guards were not letting him sleep. And they kept rattling their keys on the door, uh, banging the doors at night, and keeping the radio playing really high at night. So um, this is something that we've seen before um, the pandemic, really, the guards or the system trying to break um, the um, to break people in detention. Um, and I just want to take a minute to read some of the demands that were shared. Um, to us by people in immigration detention. Um, so this came, I'm, I'm just gonna read it. Um, I am part of a group of people participating in a hunger strike and these are our demands. Diagnostic, diagnostic testing for the whole population, follow-up protocols per CDC guidelines, a human rights representative to engage with OTI leadership, the presence of the media, the opportunity to have one representative for each pod to meet with OTI leadership to discuss, to discuss rights and medical treatment. Instructions on how to prevent spread in OTI. The guarantee that social distancing can be followed in detention. The alternative of house arrest if OTI cannot provide proper care. The guarantee that people won't experience retaliation for, for participating in hunger strike. So, People in detention are really putting their lives on the line because they know that Core Civic and ICE are deliberately putting their, right, their lives at risk. They already lost a friend and they are taking action against it. So it is our responsibility to further their efforts and demand everyone, and demand that everyone in detention is released into their communities. 
Thank you, Cynthia. Um, so we don't have any questions from the audience yet, so I think we're going to go ahead and move on to the next prompt. Um, just a reminder to, to our attendees, if you have a question for our panelists, feel free to use the Q&A function. Okay, so uh, let's go back to Vanessa with our second question. Um, what is your organization doing in response to the crisis? And what are the next steps and strategies um, for the organization moving forward? Yeah, thank you. Um, so AFSC does take an abolitionist stance on this. Um, we do not believe that um, <clears throat> that detention should exist. We don't think that people should be detained um, for any reason, but especially for um, civil detention, which is what um, immigration offenses are. Um, but yes, so around that, you know, the work that we have been doing um, on the ground, well, a lot of the work, sorry, that we have been doing has focused primarily on local and state advocacy. Um, again, around, um, or like looped into this free them all campaign and, and narrative. Um, but we, we work very closely with, um, again, like the local partners, which have been primarily um, OMDR and PSF, but there's other organizations that we um, have also been working with to essentially um, like collectively strategize through, through these issues um, and talk about you know, how, what resources do each of our respective organizations have and how can we, um, you know, collaborate with those people that, that are engaging, um, that are talking to people detained on a daily basis and how can we kind of merge everything to make the strongest, um, you know, the strongest argument um, at the state um, and federal level. Um, uh, so our state um, advocacy has, a lot of it has been through the Dignity Not Detention um, Network. Um, with that, it's a collective of, of various um, other organizations. Um, and through that, um, through that network, we, we have been able to successfully um, get meetings with uh, with various politicians. Um, there were a few meetings that were held with the governor's office. Um, we've um, had uh, Zoom <laughs> meetings with um, local legislators' offices as well. Um, and, and in that where um, we have been able to bring in, you know, the voices of the people that are detained, either by sharing some of the audios, um, that PSF or, or OMDR have recorded or um, doing somewhat like what we're doing right now, right, is sharing, uh, repeatedly sharing the stories um, from, from various people and various faces. Um, unfortunately, I will say that we, that even though we have been able to, um, to secure and have those conversations with um, elected officials, um, unfortunately, we were not really seeing um, progress, right? Um, so we have continued to make this, those same calls, you know, adding pressure um, to those same politicians that we have already made those initial contacts with. Um, we have also started reaching out to local um, public health officials. Um, again, that hasn't, we haven't unfortunately had a response, um, but we're continuing to, to kind of spread the word and make sure that um, our partners are also reaching out to, to these same targets, so to speak. Um, we obviously have um, been targeting ICE, um, which they are the ones that, that can make the determination, right, to release people from their detention centers. Um, that, again, I um, think it's frustrating to do some of this work sometimes because you feel like you are trying every single angle and um, especially right now where we're, we're limited to kind of virtual meetings and things like that. Um, it's frustrating because we sometimes feel, or at least I sometimes feel like we're 
almost a broken record where we keep on saying and saying the same things, but without seeing like the major victories that we would want to see. However, I will say that, you know, the, the small victories, um, even if they're very maybe insignificant to some people, I think when we, when we combine and we, when we collect all of these small victories that are happening all throughout the nation, you know, here locally, all throughout the state, you know, that's, that's where we get, um, a lot of us get, I think, the motivation to continue, to continue doing this work. Um, we um, right now are also um, tying in kind of this, the Free Them All work um, to just this larger campaign that we have been a part of alongside, um, again, other amazing organizations, but um, this campaign is the Defund Hate campaign. Um, and with that, it's actually um, pretty similar to what Monica was sharing about um, the idea is, that we, we don't need ICE, we don't need this oppressive immigration system, it is not benefiting anybody. Um, so we're, we're part of that, um, that call to action on the national level. Um, what else would I say? Um, we also have um, been, act and this is a lot of the, the work I think that um, AFSC does, at least locally, like the bulk of the work is around like, um, narrative shifting. Um, that I feel like is work that often gets um, maybe overlooked, right? And the power of making sure that the stories that are out in the media, the stories that are being read through the, U the San Diego Union Tribune or the Washington Post or whatever media outlet folks are listening to or reading, I mean, um, one of our goals is to make sure that the the stories that people are hearing about immigrants is is accurate and is reflective to um, to our view of what's actually happening, right? So um, it, there's four of us in our office, but um, collectively, you know, like we do media interviews. Um, our director frequently writes op-eds in English and in Spanish, which is, you know, very important. Um, oftentimes, I think a lot of this work happens only in English, um, and we forget about um, our Spanish-speaking community members and, and advocates and stuff like that. Um, so anyways, we, we do a lot of work around that. And again, the point is to um, be able to bring in a lot of this local and state and um, national advocacy that we're doing and that our partners are doing. And also, of course, well, the stories that, that we're hearing um, from, from people directly impacted, right? From the people detained, from their family members or whatnot. So when we do have these um, opportunities to do like media engagement and op-eds, we also make sure that we are working directly with people impacted and making sure that they also get the opportunity to share their voice, to share their story from their very unique perspective, which their perspective is not one that I can duplicate. I, because I, I have not been in their shoes. Um, I can only learn from them. Um, and some of the, um, right now we, we have been working on um, ways to, again, uh, work, um, work more collectively with partners to make sure that we're having um, actions, whether they are um, virtual actions or in-person actions, which would be like the car rallies that we've seen or the vigils, um, like the one for Carlos Ernesto Escobar Mejia. Um, so we're working with um, partners to make sure that we have some some sort of action like that um, on a weekly basis or a bi-weekly basis. Um, so today, for example, we put out a call to action, um, which I'll share with the organizers and if they can share with people that are listening today, that would be great. Um, but yeah, so our, our goal is to have these um, weekly and bi-weekly um, actions. Um, again, even though they feel sometimes um, 
a bit repetitive. Our goal is to make sure that people don't forget that people are are in detention and that they are scared of dying and we shouldn't stop talking about it. Thank you. Um, I'll, you know, think we'll move on to the next person. Thank you, Vanessa. Um, yeah, so as Vanessa pointed out, we are gonna share some resources with everybody at the end of, at the, end of the events. Um, but now let's turn to Monica, uh, same question to you. So what's your organization been doing in response to the crisis and what are next steps and strategies moving forward? Thank you, um, absolutely. So the ACLU uh, of San Diego and Imperial Counties is a, it's a, you know, the ACLU writ large is a legal organization. Uh, we engage in multi-pronged approaches um, to advocating for the civil rights and civil liberties of folks across the country. Um, we engage litigation, of course, um, but also policy advocacy um, and, um, and organizing and, and other strategies that really seek to leverage the many tools that we have. Um, our office has participated in a number of lawsuits um, since the, the onset of this pandemic. Um, and I could probably talk for a much longer time than I have allocated here about all of them. Um, but I, I will focus on two of those um, of those lawsuits. Uh, so we learned about what was happening at the Otero Mesa Detention Center um, pretty early on during the pandemic, um, and you know we 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 knew because of our ongoing work there. Um, but we also learned as things uh, developed in real time that folks were housed in these really crowded. Um, housing units that people were packed in these sleeping, they call them sleeping bays or cells that hold, you know, eight people at a time. Um, we knew that it was impossible by virtue of the way of the makeup of the facility for folks to engage in, in very basic preventative measures like social distancing um, and scrupulous personal hygiene. Um, and, we, you know, we knew people were forced to share equipment that, that was not properly disinfected between uses that there was a lack of access to soap, hand sanitizer, all of those things. Um, and, and so, you know, long before we, or I guess before we filed our first lawsuit, uh, we sent letters to agencies across our counties in San Diego and Imperial, um, you know, really warning these agencies that if things didn't change, if we continued business as usual, things were gonna get really bad. Um, and, and we learned in the process of really building up these cases that the Department of Homeland Security's own experts had warned the agency and Congress of the same. Um, they had really warned that if they didn't take drastic measures, we would end up in precisely the situation that we're in now here at OTI. Um, so we filed our first case in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, um, which was a multi-petitioner habeas. It, it basically, it's not a class action, uh, but it sought the release of four people uh, at once from Ote Mesa and the Imperial Regional Detention Facility. And at the time that we were building this case, we were, you know, it was the same idea. It was if we don't do these things, if we don't take these measures, there will be an outbreak. The virus will enter and transmission will happen rapidly. Um, and as we were preparing and actually as we were filing, you can see like a, a, a footnote in our initial papers um, in the case called Celaya Sagastume. Um, we learned of, of the first cases among detained people that were confirmed at, at Ote Mesa. That was on April 3rd. On April 13th, that case was dismissed because ICE voluntarily released all of our named petitioners, which we welcome. We have said over and over again that ICE has and must use its discretion to release people. Um, it, it can do that and, and they, they proved it there. But by the time we filed our next case, which is Rodriguez Alcantara, um, that, that is a class action. Um, we filed that on April 21st. By then, between April 3rd and April 21st, 18 people had tested positive. Um, and, and the number of people who were testing positive every day, every day was growing rapidly. Uh, but Rodriguez Alcantara is a class action. It seeks depopulation at, at both facilities, Otay and Imperial to a point where um, social distancing is possible and where basically people can live safely in a manner that does not violate their constitutional rights. Um, but we saw it as an emergency measure, an emergency temporary restraining order 
seeking as a logical first step to that depopulation, the immediate release of people who are medically vulnerable from Otanisa, precisely due to the outbreak. Um, and the judge in that case uh, granted our request for a temporary restraining order, which has resulted to date in the release of almost 100 people, um, including uh, Ana Maria, the woman whose story I shared earlier. Um, and so, you know, 100 people is a lot and we're thrilled um, for those people. We're thrilled for a really basic thing, which is that those people are no longer forced to live under conditions that threaten their lives and their health and safety. Um, but we remain really concerned about the people who are... But, oh my God, okay. Who are still trapped inside. Um, to date, uh, the conditions at Otemisa are, are horrific. Um, you know, while the reduction in population or the, the release of 100 people um, is very welcome news, we, uh, we, people, 160 people at least so far have tested positive. Um, and although Otemisa is the site of the largest outbreak in the country, only 220 people have been tested for COVID-19 at Otemisa so far, at least as of last Friday. Um, that's fewer than half of the people who are there now, far fewer than half of the people who were detained at the time that this outbreak was, you know, um, began. Um, and, and really, unfortunately, a couple of days ago, the judge in our case declined to turn that temporary restraining order into more permanent relief. Um, so we remain vigilant. Again, we're, we're happy and we're glad for those 100 people. Um, you know, we, we know that that outcome is just for those people, um, but we remain concerned about the people who are inside. And, and I think importantly, we remain committed to really vigilantly monitoring the conditions at both Otai and Imperial, where the first COVID positive case has been confirmed as of last week. Um, so that, that's just kind of a snapshot of, of a couple of, of our cases now. We also have a an ongoing or a case in active litigation called Alvarez um, that is on behalf of U.S. Marshals, people in U.S. Marshals custody at Otay Mesa. Um, and, and that case has followed a bit of a different trajectory. The judge at the outset there declined to issue a temporary restraining order, but that team, which I'm not a part of that core team, um, has, has remained really um, steadfast and in, in demanding relief for people in U.S. Marshals custody. Um, and, and we remain um, fully supportive and behind that effort. Um, and, and just, I'll wrap it up now, but as, as an aside, and you know, there have been a couple of other cases that we've been involved with, um, seeking things like a stop to transfers between law enforcement agencies and ICE custody across the state, um, seeking a, a, cha or a challenge to county jails across the state. Um, but we're also through our, uh, just, we have really incredible colleagues who've been working on things like putting pressure on the local field office director, having calling on folks to call in um, and really urge the field office director for ICE to release people from custody, which again, we say, we have said, and we continue to say, ICE has fully the authority and discretion to do, and it, which it must do in order to prevent any further needless escalation of this outbreak, including preventing um, any additional needless death. Um, so I'll wrap up. Thank you so much, Monica. Um, so I also want to thank everyone for your questions. We're going to get to all or most of your questions during the Q&A portion. Um, but now let's turn to Cynthia. Um, same question to you. So what has your organization been doing in response to the crisis? And what are your next steps and strategies moving forward? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so I want to begin by saying that um, there are many um, local um, groups that are doing amazing work on the ground. Um, we have um, affiliated visitation programs such as SOLAS that are based in um, San Diego, so shout out to SOLAS. Uh, but I'm going to be speaking about um, what Freedom for Immigrants is doing specifically. Um, we are a national network, um, so a lot of our energy has been focused nationally um, or statewide. So for example, um, one of our most um, solid steps that we've taken in response to this crisis was that in April, um, we launched a COVID-19 hotline for detained people, their loved ones and advocates so they could report to us um, conditions and abuses related to the virus. And we've had um, 
our immigration detention hotline before for years, then it was shut down by ICE, um, then um, we re <laughs> we got the hotline reactivated as a lawsuit, so it's, it's a little bit complicated and I'm happy to answer any follow-up questions after this webinar on the history of our hotline. Uh, but in April specifically, we, want, we launched one um, to be able to document and categorize um, human rights abuses and conditions inside um, ICE jails and prisons across the country. And this information we are making public, um, some of this information we're making public through our interaction um, detention map. Um, and every week we get hundreds of calls, um, specifically from Otay Mesa. Um, we have published about 80 of them in our map. Um, so I really encourage you to take a look through it. Um, and in addition to, to recording these, um, these conditions and abuses, we are also providing individual follow-up in the form of um, filling out humanitarian parole requests on behalf of people who are calling our hotline, um, as well as following other, other paths or support working with people um, through seeking um, re um, release in, in like non-representation ways. Um, we are also developing bi-weekly COVID-19 reports um, that are used largely from the information that we get from um, from the hotline, but also from local advocates and from news reports. And um, we, through this extensive tracking and these COVID-19 reports, we have been able to show that ICE is failing to respond to this pandemic um, and really push for policy reforms. And I'm going to mention just a, um, a couple of them. Um, so, um, I think this month, uh, the HEROES Act uh, of COVID-19 passed the House. Um, we supported the push for that, and it's really aiming to provide free and adequate access to SOAP and phone services uh, for people currently inside of detention. Um, we, uh, Freedom for Immigrants, along with another 200 or so organizations, are also advocating for the Federal Immigrant Release for Safety and Security Together Act, or FIRST Act. Um, and this is really an urgent and um, critical um, call for restrictions on immigration detention enforcement during this uh, unprecedented pandemic. Um, and large portions of these asks were also included on the HEROES Act. Um, we are also working alongside um, immigrant rights and criminal justice partners um, to push for decarceration um, efforts in California. Um, I think Vanessa also mentioned the Dignity Not Detention Coalition, which we are also a part of, and um, we are pushing for the budget to save lives, which um, would fund um, post-release services instead of detention. Um, we are also using the information that we're getting through the hotline to support lawsuits and um, to, to um, to submit uh, complaints with the Office of Civil Rights and Civil Liberties. Um, so for example, last week, not related to, um, not related to all type, but we submitted a complaint for the Adelanto detention facility um, regarding the use of toxic chemicals in the facility, which were causing uh, for people in detention to bleed through their nose, have really um, irritated eyes, and it was just a very bad, um, very bad reactions to the chemicals used at the facility, um, which we believe were in retaliation for reports of like cleaning only with water in the midst of a pandemic. Um, and overall, we just continue to monitor and advocate for the, um, for the release of people in detention. All right, thank you so much, Cynthia. Um, so at this time, I. I think we might have some uh, brief questions um, for the panelists. Do we have any questions, Jess? Sure. A couple of questions that folks are asking about. Um, one of them uh, is for Monica about the next step 
uh, next step with a class action lawsuit that uh, released 100 people is that the end of the lawsuit and will more folks be released? Um, so maybe you can address that one. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so I, I should say that as the 100 people who've been released so far are part of this, of a subclass is what we call it, of medically vulnerable people at Otay Mesa. Um, the judge ordered the government and CoreCivic, um, who are both represented in, in this lawsuit, to produce a list of all people who are medically vulnerable um, in, in their custody at Ote Mesa. And, uh, they really um, uh, stumbled in doing that. First, they said there were eight people who fit into that category, and then they said 51 to 69. And then ultimately, they produced a list of 134 people who fall into that list. Um, of the 134 people, they released, you know, nearly 100, um, and the remaining 34 are people who they want to continue to keep detained because of their criminal histories, um, and for most of them. Currently, we are working, for the people who have lawyers, we're working with their immigration lawyers. For people who don't, um, we're working directly with those folks and their families to submit um, well, like mitigation packets to the government, um, making the case for why, um, in light of the risks to their health and lives uh, during this pandemic, and in spite of whatever um, crimes for which um, they are not currently in detention, because immigration detention is civil, it's not related to any criminal matter, um, in, in light of and in spite of all those things, why they should be released. So we continue to advocate on behalf of those 34 people, um, in addition to monitoring um, what's happening at both facilities and, and just assessing our options moving forward. Great, thank you. There's also a couple of of clarifying questions about um, one, where are people who test positive in the facility being treated? Um, and are the number of cases at Otay Mesa being uh, included in the county um, numbers, if you know the answer to that question? Uh, and a, a third part of that is what's happening to the folks when they're released, uh, especially the folks who are released through the lawsuit. Um, so I'll take the first one was where are people being treated? Um, the, for the most part, people are treated by um, IHSC, which is ICE's, I think it's ICE Health Services Corps um, at Ote Mesa. Um, and we continue to take the position that the uh, medical care available to them through that at Ote Mesa is insufficient. Um, some people are taken off site to the hospital. Um, uh, so that, that's, what do I know about that? Um, the second question was... What, what's happening to folks uh, when they are released? Um, so when people are released, so one of the things that we made really clear um, throughout the course of, of this litigation is one, a lot of these folks have places to go, um, and, and we've, we've learned that through, you know, ACLU and many partner organizations participate, including Jewish Family Services San Diego, um, participation in the, the operation of the Migrant Family Shelter here in San Diego. We know a lot of people um, who, who um, end up in, in immigration detention or near the border um, have uh, destinations across the country. Sometimes it's in San Diego County, sometimes it's not. Um, and so we made really clear that, the, that a lot of folks have places to go. Um, and we also made clear that we were willing and, and there are a lot of, there's an, um, there are folks on the ground who are willing to, to make sure that any releases from ICE custody happen in a way um, that, is, that is safe for them and, and for the community. Um, we have certainly been made aware of um, ICE's just continual um, stumbles in, in the way that it effectuates people's releases. Um, but we do know that, that, you know, we're really fortunate that groups like um, Ote Mesa Detention Resistance and Allies to End Detention um, and Pueblos Sin Fronteras and, and others here in our region have really just like time and again step up to, to really 
um, support folks and accompany them post release and, and um, help or, or uh, just step up to make sure that uh, the needs of folks are met upon release, even where um, ICE or the county may have a responsibility that that they don't they don't necessarily always tend to um, in a way that is that is humane. Um, and then the other question I think was about whether um, cases out of Otemis are included within the county's um, figures, and I don't know the answer to that question right now. Thank you. So we have one last prompt for our panelists, and this actually gets at a lot of the questions from our audience. So it would be a nice uh, segue transition to our Q&A. Um, so the third question is, what can people do to help? And um, I'll turn it over to Vanessa. Yeah, thank you. Um, so my response will be pretty short. <laughs> um, again, as I was saying um, at one point earlier, you know, right now we I think are all trying to find creative ways, uh, given all of the restrictions um, that have come with the pandemic, to be able to step up and show up um, in ways, yeah, in ways that feel almost the same as as we have in the past. Right? We can't do marches. <laughs> we can't really like take to the streets um really in in the same way but we can um do some of these other things which is what we've been asking folks to do um you know to respond and participate in the multiple calls to action that you know not only our organization but a lot of our partners and a lot of just different orgs um are putting out um on a you know weekly basis um, I know um, Border Click, if any of you all um, follow them, they put on a monthly, uh, sorry, a, a weekly uh, call to action on Mondays, for example, we just put one out. Um, but another one would be to, um, I mean, the best suggestion um, would be to reach out to the organizations that are, uh, that are volunteer based so that that do the, the heavy work of, um, and like the emotionally taxing work of being in contact with people that are detained. Um, and I know um, OMDR, um, the Otay Mesa Detention Resistance, um, people can reach out to them and they can um, find ways to plug in volunteers and to provide trainings depending on various, various skills and language um, capabilities. Um, but I'll just stop there. Thank you. So we're actually getting a lot of specific questions about what students and academics can also do. Um, so for Monica and Cynthia, maybe if, if you would like to integrate that into your, into your response, that would be great. So Monica. Sure thing. Um, yeah, I guess a few different things that I that I think a lot of folks, including students, can do. Um, one is, and I'm, I'm about to put it in the chat, um, but the ACLU um, has a webinar, a five series webinar coming up called Flatten the Curve of Inequality. Um, and, and that's open to community members and students. And we're, you know, really seeking there to highlight the work of, of local groups and local advocates um, that are engaging in different types of response to the pandemic. It's not only um, immigrants' rights related, but um, I think we'll give folks a, a sense of, of what's going on, uh, what some needs are, and, and how folks can plug in. Um, so I'm going to drop that in the chat box in a second. Um, the other thing is, is I know our office has sent out a number of emails about this, but you know we continue to encourage people to call the local field office director here in San Diego um, and really demand the release of people from Otay Mesa and the Imperial Regional Detention Facility. Um, uh, that's something that, that yeah, anybody can do. Um, and, and we know that um, that pressure is important um, and, and engaging folks in creating that pressure is important. And the last thing I'll share is, um, you know, I've mentioned Otay Mesa Detention Resistance, but there are a couple of groups, it's not just OMDR, um, that are really uh, just do really incredible work to to support folks um, post release. I always say that we you know we operate in different trenches and um, and not to use that that analogy, but uh, you know we we do the litigation and, and um, 
often, you know, our work is really complemented and we complement the work of other people. We, we need to do all of this together. We won't win alone and we won't win um, by doing it all. Um, and so we really look to the leadership of groups like OMBR and Pueblos Sin Fronteras. Um, and, um, and there's also a bond fund in our region called the Borderlands Get Free Fund that helps people post bonds um, for uh, when folks who are detained at Otemisa and Imperial or folks who are detained elsewhere but are, are you know, community um, members of our communities. Um, oftentimes they have bonds, they're trapped in places like Otay because they can't pay their bonds. Um, and, and there are some bond funds across the country, um, including the Borderlands Get Free Fund, which is fiscally sponsored by Freedom for Immigrants. Um, that can always use support and, and that's any any support big or small nothing is too small every you know dollar donated to the borderlands get free fund goes to pay the bonds of people who can't afford to pay their own um so thank you thank you monica so our chat function is actually disabled for this event however if you send me any resources that you would like to share with attendees we will follow up with everybody uh, with an email Okay, so next we have Cynthia. Uh, what can people do to help? Thank you. Um, so I, I always think about, um, about these questions in a twofold strategy. So I think about them as participate and elevate. Um, and that's really how I make sense of it in my, in my own head. Um, so I'm going to go through participate first. Um, and all of these are um, efforts that you can do as you know a concerned person or as a student or as a professional really like anyone can participate in this um, so the first one that i always uh, mention is volunteer get your um, get your hands on the ground um, freedom for immigrants specifically has um, several programs that um, that can allow for people to be involved in these ways. So, of course, I'm going to talk about the hotline. So, answering calls from people in detention and contributing to our efforts to monitor um, abuses and conditions inside of these facilities, as well as providing, um, you know, a human connection with um, with people uh, in detention facilities across the country. Um, you can also get involved through visitation. I mentioned that in San Diego, there is um, SOLAS, our affiliated visitation program. Um, right now, visitation is limited um, or, or prohibited um, because of the pandemic. And um, But there's still um, a lot of openings um, by getting involved with a visitation program um, or any local program that um, that is um, that is actively working with people in detention and that have done so for years. Um, so Otemesa Detention Resistance has been mentioned, uh, Pueblos Sin Fronteras has been mentioned, SOLAS as well, uh, Allies to End Detention. Um, so there there are um, there are community-based groups as well as national efforts happening. Um, Another way in which you can get involved and directly support someone in detention is by um, getting involved in our sponsorship and community accompaniment um, uh, programs. So Freedom for Immigrants is an ab abolitionist organization and as part of our vision of a world beyond detention, we are trying to model how that world will look like. Um, so I think Monica was mentioning that um, there are many people in the ground that are willing to open up their homes. Um, so we, we actively are recruiting for sponsors and also volunteers that can um, work with people um, in formerly detained in um, post-release. Um, another, way, another way in which you can uh, participate is, and this has been mentioned before, there are a lot of amazing organizers already doing this work. Um, so really we want to make those efforts stronger instead of creating like a lot of little bubbles. Um, so reach out and participate in calls for action. Um, I think this has been mentioned already, or at least I think I saw it on the chat on the chat, but there are calling campaigns to Governor Newsom and Attorney General Becerra. Um, so really just like, I, I know this sounds like everyone is asking you to 
um, to call, to make a call, but it really does make that difference. We've seen this in Mesa Verde, which is also here in California, um, where a very aggressive calling campaign resulted in uh, the liberation of all of the women detained in that facility. So I know this sounds like everyone is asking you to make calls and this is not going to end up in anything, but we have seen results. And there are some tips going on around online on how to prevent um, calling fatigue. Um, let's see. Um, and then Monica also mentioned donating to a bond fund. Um, and then the second part, I know that the first participate part was really long, um, but I'll, I'll make this quick. Uh, the second part is the elevate. Um, so as I've mentioned before, people in detention are not, are not passive, they are organizing and they are resisting um, detention. Um, so really elevating those efforts and honoring those efforts anytime that you um, see a petition going on or that you are asked to elevate those to members of your community, to your local legislators. Um, we really want to be, to be doing that um, whenever there are, you know, demonstrations really elevating peop um, the people in detention. That's, that's really important. Um, so that's what I have to say about um, what people can do in this fight. Um, I additionally see here a question specifically about um, um, information of the virus in languages other than English. And we are mapping this on our detention map. Um, we are seeing that even when information is provided about how to prevent the spread of the virus, of course, we already talked about how that's not really possible. Um, but even then, it's only provided in English or just in English and Spanish. And, um, you know, people in detention may speak um, languages other than English and Spanish. They may speak an indigenous language or, um, or Hindi, Urdu, French, Dali, like anything, really. Um, so we are definitely seeing a gap there. Um, so that's that's all I have to share for the moment. Thank you. So I think we can go ahead and uh, transition to the Q and A, and I'll let Jess take it away. Uh, yeah. Thanks everyone for your questions. Some of them have uh, been answered, and we'll try to get to the remaining questions. I do want to address before turning it over to the uh, panelists that there's been a lot of questions about specifically what students and faculty um, not only can do, but what is our responsibility as academics who, uh, where there's a long pattern maybe of more co-opting uh, social movements for research or publications or um, for something for our students to do in class and and that those that might not have a big return uh, for the community organizations that are doing this work. Um, so I uh, uh, wonder if if you could address that um, and I also just want to say for myself as an academic my answer to this question is to try to redistribute university resources to community organizations, um, such as through events like this, where we're able to actually um, pay our panelists for participating today. Um, but if you have other ways that you'd like to um, address that question of ways that you've seen students and faculty really contribute to the mo movements rather than taking, that would be great. So I, I can speak a little bit about that. Um, I have two thoughts. Um, one, I think you mentioned it, yes, um, that it's really important to center research on, um, you know, something that will help the community that you are um, studying or doing your project on. Um, a specific, right now I can think of, we also have a policy volunteer position, um, which is mainly about research. And we use that research to advocate for, um, for people 
for people's release or for the abolition of the detention system. So that's something that if you're interested in participating, you can reach out um, to Freedom for Immigrants. Something else that I, I've been thinking a lot about and we've been discussing about is how to shift academic research from um, viewing people in detention or really any vulnerable community as a subject and really empower them as researchers themselves. themselves. Um, so either through exploring participatory uh, based participatory action research, I don't know if I'm using the proper term, I'm not an academic, um, but really focusing on a research uh, method that is not looking at people in detention as subjects. Because as I mentioned, they, people are not um, passive, they are researchers themselves. We wouldn't have the, like all of the information that we have about detention if we were relying on ICE to tell us um, what's happening. Um, so yeah, just really honoring um, people in detention as researchers. If I can just add on really quick, um, I'll just, so I, I also agree that I think that um, researchers, academics could do um, a better job at like identifying the research, um, like research questions, et cetera. Um, I personally really like the work that Professor Tom Wong does. Um, which he's based there at UCSD. Um, I'm actually a fellow at his uh, USIPC, the US Immigration Policy Center. Um, but anyways, the reason why I, and I'm not an academic, I'm a social worker, like I don't think I ever want to work in academia. Um, it's very scary to me for some very strange reason. But anyways, um, the reason why like I wanted to be able to work with him is because I think he's he's found a way to find like gaps in data and gaps in almost like the narrative around like the whole like immigration issue, right? And then he's really found also um, he's drawn the lines or connected the dots between like those gaps and um, like potential litigation and in between has connected, you know, like the work that is being done on the ground, whether it's like the shelters by um, the shelters in Tijuana with like the MPP folks, what's happening in courts, what, you know, the ACLU is doing, what, you know what I mean? So I think um, almost, I guess an academic can prep for that type of work if they, um understand i guess like the land a little bit better outside of of like the academic bubble um and i know that's really difficult right and i'm sure it's also very difficult for students to like how do we how do we approach organizations how do we like understand um you know what what's actually being done and and stuff like that but um i will say that as um cynthia said like there's there's a lot of um, grassroots orgs and nonprofits that would like die to have more research <laughs> uh, and more data, but we just, we don't have like the internal skills. Like I'm not a researcher. I don't know how to put a research project together really, you know, but, um, but like we, we know that we can definitely use big data you know, so, so very long story short, I probably keep on going on this longer rant, but um, I think, you know, it, we are partially responsible also, we being like community organizers, it's like, um, we also need to be open to having those conversations and opening up spaces and being able to offer, you know, this feedback um, in, in like a productive way and find ways where we can like, you know, how can we all work together? But yeah. I think you're on mute. Apologies, I'm multitasking, trying to answer people's questions. <laughs> that was really fantastic. And um, I didn't know if any uh, one else wanted to jump in or um, I think as academics, we often um, 
uh, worry a bit about our, our impact and don't really realize that um, community organizers are actually using our research and um, that they do need us to keep, keep doing our work. Um, and of course, there are more ethical ways for us to engage, ways that are driven by communities, um, that are driven by people inside, and uh, we can mobilize those methodologies in, in better ways. Um, but our work uh, is, is actually used and, and important to community organizations. So um, thank you so much for that. Um, I, there was a, a great question um, about how specifically we might build a collective platform for action here in San Diego or Southern California. Um, you've mentioned a lot of really fantastic statewide coalitions and national coalitions. Um, and I'm wondering uh, what, um, uh, if you're part of any uh, coalitions here in the San Diego area or, or Southern California that uh, you can promote um, that people may uh, join to, to learn more about the specific Free Them All campaign and, and ongoing work. I can go ahead and start, but um, so I would say like here locally, um, a few of us uh, organizations are part of the, um, I wouldn't say it's like, it's like a loosely defined coalition, right? Um, the Free Them All San Diego Coalition. Um, but um, I think the, one of the good things about this, um, this uh, supposed coalition is that there's um, people can participate that are not particularly tied to uh, an organization. So I feel like a lot of the coalition work sometimes gets a little bit muddy and like very challenging because some coalitions or some collective work um, the, the organizers or the, the leaders of that work tend to to want folks to participate that are tied to like some other organization. So it's, I think sometimes challenging for community members that aren't part of some other group to, to then like be engaged and participate. Um, but anyway, so around this Free Them All work, um, that's one coalition that we are barely starting off. Um, <laughs> And I know that we're still trying to like work through like what that'll look like exactly and like what type of collective work. But anyways, it's a good space for anybody that does want to be like more engaged to at least um, be able to meet other people that are doing this type of work locally and um, just kind of hear, um, sometimes we like share updates. Um, will brainstorm on collective actions or whatnot. So if anybody does um, really want to get involved with that, um, you guys can feel free to reach out to me. It's completely fine. Um, some of the, like the dignity, not detention work, um, my understanding and maybe Cynthia can clarify, but it's also more um, like organization based. Um, so I personally don't know how community members can can like directly engage with like the organizing organizing part of that coalition, but um, I mean the materials are are on the websites and we do share it's like branded material that folks can retweet or <laughs> reshare whatnot. Um, but yeah, I'll, I don't know if Cynthia has something else to add to that about like collective organizing or um, Monica, sorry. You yeah, know, I, I completely agree with you, Vanessa. Um, I, I am not based in San Diego anymore. I'm in Los Angeles. Um, um, I, I would agree that the Dignity Not Detention Coalition, um, which is statewide, is more organiz organization based. Um, so if you want to get involved in those efforts, the best way to go about it is to get involved with the local um, organized uh, organization in, that's participating in the coalition. Yeah. 
thank you so much for all of the information that you've shared tonight. We have uh, just a couple of minutes left and uh, uh, Professor Mann was going to share some of the resources that we've talked about tonight um, uh, on the screen. So if you're attending tonight and you'd like to get involved, uh, we're, we're going to share some resources right now. I just want to thank our, our panelists uh, for their time. It's, uh, it's incredibly valuable and I hope that uh, we've inspired some of the attendees tonight to join in the work. Thank you so much. Um, so by way of concluding, I just want to share some additional resources, some of which were talked about by our panelists, but many um, which are not. So hopefully, um, Unfortunately, we weren't able to get to many of your great questions because of time, but hopefully these resources will allow you um, kind of a, a place to get started um, to do, to continue to do the work that you're interested in doing. So um, first and foremost, I wanna encourage you to visit the websites of these organizations, um, both those that are featured today um, from our panelists and also others, um, including Mi Gente, and Otay Mesa Detention Resistance, um, and many others that are, not, um, that are not represented here on the screen to learn more about the work of these organizations in the struggle. Um, so many of these websites will have a wealth of resources. Um, on the AFSC website, you can find these two reports, Children at the Crosshairs of Immigration Enforcement and Dismantling Asylum, the Year into the Migrant Protection Protocols, uh, both of which were written by Vanessa, our guest speaker, and that reflects the AFSC's documentation work. On the Freedom for Immigrants website, there's an amazing interactive map um, showing all the detention centers throughout the U.S., as well as an incredible 16-part immigration detention syllabus um, for academics and non-academics alike that teaches us how to dissect and dismantle the immigration detention system. And lastly, I wanna call attention to two recent books, um, Naomi Peck's Bands, Walls, Rates, Sanctuary, Understanding U.S. Immigration for the 21st Century, and Laura Briggs, Taking Children, A History of American Terror, um, both just published by uh, University of California Press, and both <laughs> offering much needed historical analysis of our current <laughs> moment. Um, so with that, I just want to thank each of our speakers for sharing their insights and incredible work with us, to Jess for moderating our conversation, to Anna Marie, our staff, for handling the logistics of this event and making this possible. And lastly, I want to thank our two ASL interpreters, Paul and Kaylin, and also to all of you for joining us. Um, thank you so much and have a good night. Thank you.